as you can tell by the title, so redo space. I'm going to wait because I'm going to see if the sound is working. Just so for the record on wax, Apartheid Clyde fucked up the app. So now we have glitches that we didn't have before. So, you know, fuck that colonizer. But hopefully people can hear. I'm going to wait so I can get someone to tell me that they can. Oh, you, you we can hear? Oh, shit. Hell yeah. All right. Thanks, Joe. I, I'm just going to start over because for the recording sake, I don't think the last one took. So chapter 12, considering fixes. Um, as a nation, we have paid an enormous price for avoiding an obligation to remedy the unconstitutional segregation we have allowed to fester. African-Americans, of course, suffer from our evasion. But so, too, does the nation as a whole. Just real quick, because I'm going to try to like breeze through this. Oh, there's my baby moms. Can you hear, too? Oh, shit. I don't think so. Oh, yeah. OK, good. Real quick. So the you already know from the last recordings that this has been by Ofe. So the language is going to be very soft and just dismissive at times and tries to obfuscate from the truth. But we're reading with intent to liberate ourselves. So, you know, just keep that in mind. All right. As a nation, we have paid an enormous price for avoiding an obligation to remedy the unconstitutional segregation we have allowed to fester. African-Americans, of course, suffer from our evasion, but so too does the nation as a whole, as do whites in particular. Many of our serious national problems either originate with residential segregation or have become intract intractable because of it. We have greater political and social conflict because we must add unfamiliarity with fellow citizens of different racial backgrounds to the challenges we confront in resolving legitimate disagreements about public issues. So again, that's wrong as fuck because it's not that oh these crackers had issue public issues to resolve through politics and now they must consider the negroes too that's not how the fuck this country was built <laughs> like let's stop playing like these policies they literally deliberately did to a people so that they could exploit them and extract profit from like it was profitable for them to do so and it worked in their favor and that's why they did it and when they talk about having to deal with unfamiliarities, the unfamiliarities is the resistance of the black people being exploited. Like, oh, goddamn, y'all won't let me just oppress y'all in peace. Y'all mean y'all really going to protest? Y'all really going to do demonstrations? Y'all really going to build alternative systems? Yes. And then when black people did that, guess what? This whole part about, oh, we have to deal with unfamiliarities. No, those crackers went into black neighborhoods and terrorized them. So, no, we, the way, oh, I can't stand these crackers. Let me keep going. My bad, y'all. But no, th remember that. Because when he when they word it like that, because they do that today, too, like they make it seem like, oh, if we just all get along and ignore our differences, everything be copacetic. And we're like, that's not the problem here. The problem here, you won't leave us the fuck alone. Like they literally just had a shooting with some guy in his 20s who tried to get into HBCU and couldn't get in. So he went to the dollar store and killed three black people. And you're going to try to tell me that this is by accident that, oh, we're just dealing with unfamiliar familiarities. No, no, sir. So, yeah, as I read this, remember this old phase words <laughs> take with a whole bucket of salt and we're just reading for our liberation. We get the facts out of this, but all his other bullshit, we just going to call that out and keep it moving swiftly and professionally. Whites may, may support political candidates who pander to their sense of racial entitlement. Sorry, y'all. We have greater political and social conflict because we must add unfamiliarity with fellow citizens. That's what he's talking about. Talking about we have to deal with black people issues like we created them. <laughs> Cracker, please, of different racial backgrounds to the challenges we confront in resolving legitimate disagreements about public issues. Racial polarization stemming from our separateness has corrupted our politics. And again, he says like our separateness, like as though that's just the natural thing. When literally in the beginning, in the one through six chapters, he talks about how that separateness didn't even exist in some places and how it was imposed upon a people. And that if they didn't go along with segregation, black or white, that there was swift punishment for it. And you lost out not only economically, but socially. <sighs> Crackers. Permitting leaders who ignore the interest of white working class voters to mobilize them with racial appeals. Whites may support political candidates who pander to their sense of racial entitlement while advocating policies that perpetuate the inferior economic opportunities that some whites may face. Interracial and that basically just means that these crackers will choose like a Donald Trump because he's rich and represents wealth and say, oh, well, if I pick him, at least he'll get rid of the Mexicans. And 
literally their living conditions and their material conditions are constantly getting worse and they keep picking fascists that keep driving it worse. That's what he's saying. But we don't like to use strong language when it comes to old phase. And I'm tired of that. Interracial political alliances become more difficult to organize when whites develop overly intolerant judgments of the unfortunate. So when he talks about building political alliances, I don't know if many of y'all know my stance. White people do, are not revolutionary. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> they just not. <laughs> like, so sorry. Every If we read about labor movements and any other movements they were involved in, yes, there are individual whites who may have helped and done the right thing, which I call the bare minimum, because we're talking about violation of human rights. And for you not to be for the violation of human rights, that's the basic minimum. You don't get a cookie and an award for that. But you'll read how, as a group and as a collective, they betray us every fucking time for um, concessions and upward mobility in the system. And again, this book covers it too and has already in previous chapters. So no, it's not because they get introduced to unfamiliar people, aka black folks. It's because these people are dedicated to white supremacy and to the status quo, which is fascism. Interracial political alliances become more difficult to organize when whites develop overly intolerant judgments of the unfortunate from need to justify their own acceptance of segregation that so obviously conflicts with both their civic ideas and their religious ones. Segregation did not, did not conflict with the religious ones at all. We already know the white supremacy within Christianity, but another day. The existence of black ghettos is a visible reminder of our inequalities and history, a reminder whose implications are so uncomfortable that we find ways to avoid them. Whites can develop a dysfunctional cynicism from living in a society that proclaims values of justice while maintaining racial not in inequalities that belie those values. It is not only the, dis the distribution of our national wealth that suffers from racial isolation, but also our productivity in generating what that wealth. I know this cracker did not try to put a rain uh, fucking rainbow coalition type shit on fucking capitalism. <laughs> uh, y'all, y'all see why I be saying burn this shit down? Every day they come up with new language to tell us to accept it, just make little fine-tuned changes. No, fuck that. Burn it all down. I can't fucking breathe. Social psychologists have found that segregation can give whites an unrealistic belief in their own superiority, leading to poor performance if they feel less need to challenge themselves. Experiments show that when we are in teams with others from similar, similar backgrounds, we tend to go along with the popular view rather than think for ourselves, resulting in less creative groups and more prone to make errors. That's capitalism. That's racial capitalism, my guy. Get out of here. As for children, segregation is not healthy for either whites or African-Americans. In segregated schools, neither can, neither can gain experience navigating the adverse environments in which, as adults, they will have to make their way. For low-income African-American children, the social... Real quick, y'all. This is giving me heartburn. I hate reading about this shit and they want to center how this hurts white folks. Fuck them crackers. <laughs> they could literally revolt. Like, just like they want to storm the Capitol to install a fascist. Guess what? They can storm all these other institutions and, and tear this shit down and overthrow the racist capitalist system. So I don't want to hear that shit. <laughs> like, stop that. Enough. Like, the fact that they can live in the same material conditions or the same uh, system as us, right? Drive in their cars and every day see someone homeless or and hungry on the streets begging and they ride right past and then talk about how oh they need to do the, for themselves and pull themselves up by their bootstraps and then talk about I'm a real Christian because I praise Jesus knowing good and well if Jesus was alive today they would hang his ass like man I don't want to hear about this I'm tired of them giving white folks like this how does this affect white people how do you list all this shit about segregation and say how does this affect white people this cracker violated I can't stand him sorry <laughs> section one as for children <laughs> For low-income African-American children, the social economic disadvantages with which they frequently come to school make higher achievement more difficult. Consider just one example, asthma, an affliction from which African-American children suffer at nearly twice the rate of white children, probably because African-Americans live in or near residential industrial neighborhoods with more dust, pollutants, and vermin. That's exactly where the story should always be told, centered Black people, the oppressed people. I don't want to hear about how crackers are affected. Asthmatic children are more likely to awaken at night wheezing, and if they come to school after an episode, can be drowsy and less able to pay attention. A child who has more frequent absences from poor health, unreliable transportation, having to stay home to care for younger siblings, or family instability will have less opportunity to benefit from instruction. Not all students with these disadvantages perform poorly. A few with asthma achieve at higher levels than typical children without this and similar disadvantages. But on average, a student with problems like these stemming from life in segregated neighborhoods perform poorly. If such a child attends school 
where few others have these handicaps. A mostly middle class school teacher can devote special attention to help so that the child can accomplish more than he or she would otherwise. But if most students in a classroom share these impediments, teachers cannot devote special attention to each one. Damn, can y'all imagine that shit? I mean, for teachers in this space, y'all live it. Like, to be a teacher in Black neighborhoods and seeing, like, the environmental racism and why their apartments are built on landfills and these kids have asthma, bronchitis, living in food deserts so they can't get access to healthy food, not access to uh, living uh, jobs that pay living wages so they can't even buy food. And you have to teach these poor, hungry, sick kids who are suffering from, like, you know, the threat of white terrorism every day because every time they look on their phones, another hashtag is coming up. And you have to try to teach these kids with the curriculum they tell you to teach. <sighs> Shout out to the teachers, man. In that case, curriculum becomes remedial and too much time is taken from instruction for discipline. High average achievement is almost impossible to realize in a low income segregated school embedded in a segregated neighborhood. Many children in it could do much better in an integrated school leading to their stronger and more likely positive contributions to society later as adults. And you already know I disagree with that, not because I'm not saying that they wouldn't do better in integrated schools, but that's not the thing. They would do better under schools that were not built on landfills, houses that weren't built next to like garbage plants and shit. They would do better if they had jobs that, again, had work-life balance and paid a living wage, like all these other conditions they would do better than, but they make it seem like the only thing they want is to have a multiracial neighborhood. That's not what these people are fighting for, bro. Like in that shit, the false sense of superiority that segregated fosters, the segregation fosters in whites contributes to their rejection of policies to integrate American society. The lower achievement of African-American children that results from life in a segregated neighborhood adds another impediment to those children's ability to merge into middle class workplaces. In these ways, segregation perpetuates itself and it continues existence, making it even harder to reverse. But again, that's why it's there. Like, that's why the system is the way it is. It's not saying like, oh, we just didn't know better. And now we realize people are suffering, but now the machine works itself. No, they fight to constantly update it as well, to change it to whatever prevailing norms is. When people become too oppressed and, and their life is too restrictive and people start talking about socialism and communism, well, guess what? All of a sudden you start getting concessions here and there and try to show you a picture of, actually, it's not that bad, y'all, type shit. And when that doesn't work, repression kicks in then they're like all right since y'all gonna get this fascism either way either way whether you like it or not and so that's when you see people like a politician in florida stand up and say socialists and communists can't come here or they'll be killed and that's when you see you know people being erased from history black people being erased from history lgbtq plus people being erased from history that's when you see all that repression comes out because they're like look we're not going to make your conditions better so what y'all going to do and that's my question what are we going to do Y'all know my answer. Remedy that can undo remedies that can undo nearly a century of de jure residential segregation will have to be both complex and, and imprecise. After so much time, we can no longer provide adequate justice to the descendants of those whose constitutional rights were violated. The brother just the brother. Ooh, Lord, help me. That cracker <laughs> literally just said that, yo, we're so far gone. The system can't even fix it. It wouldn't even matter like how many band-aids we put. The damage is done as was intended. Our focus can be only to develop policies that promote an integrated society. And you know what I say, our solution is revolution. It has to be the power in the hands of the people. Don't trust the state to sell, you know, like, you know, diverse capitalism or <laughs> diverse fascism <laughs> or fascism with a rainbow. Like, fuck that. <laughs> this is the empire is trying to save itself. And it's going to try to put out a, a picture of that things are rosy and okay. And, oh, y'all survived this long. <laughs> you can survive a little bit more. This isn't, we don't want to survive. Yo, we want to live. We want to thrive. And the only way to do that, like I said, the logical conclusion, it's revolution. The challenge is more difficult because low-income African-Americans today confront not only segregation, but also the income stagnation and Black mobility faced by all Americans and families with low or moderate incomes. Historically, African-Americans have made progress mostly when opportunity is expanding for all and whites are less fearful of competition from others. Thus, to provide an adequate environment for integration efforts, the United States also needs a full employment policy, minimum wages that return to their historic level and keep up with inflation 
and a transportation infrastructure that makes it possible for low-income workers to get the jobs that are available. This book is not the place is not the place to argue for these or similar policies. I was about to say because I'm not trying to hear it because to me none of his shit is radical. He's basically trying to trying to promote reform. He's like, there's not really anything wrong with the system. You know, maybe if we just put little band-aid patches here and there, we can actually make it work and then, you know, hold hands and sing kumbaya. No, that's not what's going That's It does not work and it is not working. So yeah, I'm glad he's not going to argue this no more. Shut the whole hell up. This book is not the place to argue for these or similar policies, what, but what I would be remiss if I pretended that desegregation was compatible with economic stress and insecurity. I hesitate to offer suggestions about desegregation policies and remedies because imprecise and incomplete though they may be, thank you for acknowledging that, Cracker. Remedies are inconceivable as long as citizens, whatever their political views, continue to accept the myth of de facto segregation. If segregation was created by accident or by undefined private prejudices, it is too easy to believe that it can only be reversed by accident or in some mysterious way, by changes in people's hearts. But if we, the public and policymakers, acknowledge that the federal, state, and local governments segregated our metropolitan areas, we may open our minds to considering how these same federal, state, and local governments might adopt equally aggressive policies to desegregate. And uh, let me see how long this chapter is. Ooh. All right. <laughs> Yo. Yeah, let me speed through this. Because the thing is, is that he talks about, like, um, like his last paragraph we just read where if the federal government and state, federal, state, and local would just admit and acknowledge. So, of course, we've all been keeping track of, like, our current events, where, especially in the last, like, seven plus years, that there is no, like, sugarcoating it. That whole, you know, let's uh, not be so... That's why they didn't like Trump. He was so uncouth. He was saying out loud the shit that they had already practiced not to while still implementing those policies that were racist, are racist and white supremacist policies. His ass was coming out like, oh, yeah, man, I'm about to do white supremacy, you know, times 10. He's like, they're like, yo, motherfucker, you're not supposed to say that out loud. But they see that note that we didn't burn the shit down. So they're like, oh, OK, y'all cool with this. So now you're seeing more and more of his type coming about. Now you're having the most. What's that dude? Vivek or whatever the fuck his name is. Like you're seeing you're going to see more characters come out because now they know they can say the most inflammatory things. They can lie straight to your fucking face and then tell you you deserve to be lied to and to lick my shoe. And they're like, the people are going to do it because what else do we got? But again, don't fall for that. What else do we got shit? We got each other. We got the power. If we all stop working tomorrow, if we did a general strike, if we organize for a general strike and what that looks like is real quick, that means creating food sovereignty programs so that way if they close down the local grocery store because they don't want this block to be autonomous and they don't want this block to general strike, we already have our own food programs in place in which we can feed ourselves when they do that. Creating solar panels and other alternative forms of electricity so that when they uh, they uh, like do rolling blackouts in areas that are doing general strikes in black areas, we won't have to depend on them for electricity. Then we'll be ready for that shit. Talks like that we need to have because as West Africa is standing up right now, shout out to, um, I'm sorry if I say the name wrong, Gabon right now, who just threw out the French and is like, hey, us too. Shit, they need, we need to be here in the Imperial Corps. We need to be on that type of time because, yeah, they can kick the shit off. But in order to sustain global revolution and liberation, the people in the Imperial Corps have to stand up and have to mobilize and organize and they have to get to work. Like it can't be sustained in the global South without it also happening in the West and in the Imperial Corps. And George Jackson said it like my baby moms be telling me all the time, like, yo, you can't have, you know, you can't have the fight at home and abroad. The empires will have to choose. So that gives us a special place and a special role in this. So when we see Africa stand up, yes, support it. But what are we doing here? Oh, sorry, I went on a tangent. <laughs> Let me try to get through this book so y'all can get this information. Only if we can develop a broadly shared understanding of our common history will it be practical to consider steps we could take to fulfill our obligations. Short of that, we can make a start. Several promising programs are being pursued in some jurisdictions, civil rights and fair housing organizations in most cities advocate and in many cases help to implement reforms that begin to, you know what, I'm going to ask someone a favor because I just got a prison call, so I'm going to try to get in touch with them. Does anybody in here have the PDF? I think my baby mom's put it in the jumbotron. And does anyone else want to read? You no pressure. You don't have to. I'm gonna just try to get through it. But oh, there she go. Because I'm trying to read super fast, but I also want y'all to be able to understand and hear it. 
So it's not fair to y'all that I'll read super fast and then go off on my tangents and y'all might not be able to hear it. So appreciate you choose for helping. Anybody else can yeah. too. But. I can. I have to just give me a second to just pull it up. That's cool. I'm going to go ahead. I'm on section three, uh, page 199. So I'm going to go ahead and read that section. Uh, let's see. Sorry, y'all. I'm parked on the side of the highway. So I'm going to turn on my car and hopefully it's not too loud in the background. All right. Cool. One of the most commonly used American history textbooks is the Americans Reconstruction to the 21st Century, a thousand page volume published by Holt McDougall, a division of the publishing giant Huffington Milfin Harcourt. It lists several well-respected professors as authors and editors. The 2012 edition has to say about residential segregation in the North. African-Americans found themselves forced into segregated neighborhoods. That's it. One passive voice sentence. No suggestion of who might have done the forcing or how it was implemented. And that's in the book about the reconstruction. Of course, again, like that's why when y'all hear me say the author, and I'm like, oh, the author is, the author is an ofe. That's for a reason. So you'll know like what perspective they're coming from. The Americans also contain this paragraph. A number of New Deal programs concerned housing and home mortgage problems. The Homeowners Loan Corporation provided government loans to homeowners who faced foreclosure because they couldn't meet their loan payments. In addition, the 1934 National Housing Act created the Federal Housing Administration. The agency continues to furnish loans for, more, for home mortgages and repairs. So y'all, the Homeowners Loan Corporation and the FHA, remember those were two organizations that were mentioned that actually implemented segregation. So in this book, they present the book called The Americans that he's talking about is like painting a picture that these helped the housing market, but what they're talking about is for crackers only and by keeping black people out or or by exploiting them by charging them three times as much for something, not even a quarter of the quality. The authors do not mention that an enduring legacy of the HOLC was to color code every urban neighborhood by race so that African-Americans would have great difficulty getting mortgages that the FHA suburbanized the entire nation on a whites only basis and is overlooked. The textbook does acknowledge, does acknowledge that a number of New Deal agencies with the truth is that it was virtually all paid lower wages to African-Americans than to whites, but fails to refer to the residential segregation imposed by the government's public housing projects. United States History Reconstruction to the Present, a 2016 textbook issued by the educational publishing giant Pearson offers a similar account. It celebrates the FHA's and VA support of single family developments and gives, let me tell you, an example of suburbanization without disclosing that African Americans were excluded. It boasts that the PWA's bridge, dam, power plant, and government building projects, but omits describing its insistence on segregated housing. Like the Americans, it employs the passive voice to avoid explaining segregation. <laughs> so does he, but talk about the fucking Spider Man meme here, but whatever. <laughs> In the so north, you want me to pick up four, right? Pick up huh? section four. Pick up section um, section four. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. I'm almost there. Mm -hmm. The Americans it employs the passive voice to avoid explaining segregation. In the north, too, African Americans face segregation and discrimination, even where there were no explicit laws de facto segregation or segregation by unwritten customs or traditions was a fact of life. African Americans in the north were denied housing in many neighborhoods. This is. I don't know, I don't know oh, I'm sorry, I lost my place, y'all. Oh, there was nothing unwritten about government policy to promote segregation in the North. It was spelled out in the FHA underwriting manual and the PWAs and subsequent agencies, racial designation of housing projects and congressional votes on the 1949 public housing integration amendment and in written directives of federal and state officials. Basically what that's saying is that literally segre racial segregation was written not only in their bylaws, but in their policies and amendments. So it was a fact. With very rare exceptions, textbook after textbook adopts the same mythology, meaning what we see happening now where they're taking uh, slavery and saying that they're indentured servants or involuntary servants or people who were just coming here looking for a job. And we're seeing that in textbooks all over the fucking country. They also did the same thing when describing segregation in this time by, you know, basically leaving it out. And just talking about these agencies that implemented segregation, especially in places where there wasn't, as the good guys who provided housing for Americans. And when they say that, they mean au fait. 
Uh, let's see. With very rare exceptions, textbook after textbook adopts the same mythology. If middle and high school students are being taught a false history, is it any wonder that they come to believe that African-Americans are segregated only because they don't want to marry or because they prefer to live only among themselves? Is it any wonder that they grow up inclined to think that programs to ameliorate ghetto conditions are simply undeserved handouts? That is the purpose of like one of the purposes of wiping out our history. That is so, that's why it disheartened me to see like people co-signing Ron DeSantis, erasing black people from AP African-American history course. One of the people I know worked on it was Nitra along with 200, 200 other black teachers. And she had to go in spaces and literally break down what the curriculum was and people were just unwilling to hear it. They wanted to side with a whole fascist and erasing their history and then wonder like why we're in the position we are today. But not only that, makes it increasingly difficult for the next generation to organize against this without the tools to know why or how. But baby mom, she can go ahead and take it over. It's uh, section four if you're ready. Yeah. So in 2015, the Obama administration unveiled a rule to implement an underappreciated provision of the 19th Ooh, is that me? Or can everybody hear her? Can y'all hear me? Okay, I can hear you now. My bad. It kind of broke up a little bit. Okay. Um, I'll just start all over. In 2015, the Obama administration unveiled a rule to implement an underappreciated provision of the 1960 Fair Housing Act that requires jurisdictions to receive federal funds to affirmatively further the, the purposes of the law. The rule instructed cities, towns, oh shit, I'm so sorry. Wait one second. <laughs> nah, you good. I'll take it over. Uh, you could do chat, uh, section five. In 2015, hey, the Obama wait. administration. Huh? I said it's the Obama. Wait. The Obama administration unveiled a rule to implement an un underappreciated provision of the 1968 Fair Housing Act that requires jur jurisdictions that receive federal funds to affirmatively further the purpose of the law. The rule instructed cities, towns, and suburbs to assess their concentrations or absence of disadvantaged populations, meaning Black folks, and identify goals to remedy segregated conditions. The rule seemed to assume that segregated white communities want to do the right thing but don't have adequate information to do so. <laughs> Bullshit. Giving suburbs around the country the benefit of the doubt may have been a smart way to encourage them to, to, to fulfill their affirmatively further application. I'm sorry, to fulfill their affirmatively furthering obligations, which was a whole lot. Left unsaid was what HUD might do if suburbs don't take steps necessary to advance integration. Did the Obama administration plan to deny federal funds to suburbs that remain segregated? Police killings of young black men in 2014 to 2015 called renewed attention to our racial divide. The presidential election of 2016 revealed that the nation was almost evenly split between those who believe that we've done too much to remedy, too much. <laughs> we've done too much to remedy racial inequality and those who believe we've done not nearly enough. How the fuck do you do? <laughs> Crackers are crazy. Okay, y'all. Too, mm. in early, how do you be too free? How you stop being evil? Like, how do you do too much to stop being evil? Like, my yo, they're wildin'. <laughs> it's not funny, but it's just like every day I'd be like, y'all. Anyway. Uh, but even if the rule were to survive, <laughs> or if a future administration reintroduces it, effective remedies for racial inequality would be unlikely unless the public is disabused of the de facto myth and comes to understand how government at all levels insulted or constitutional principles regarding race. Uh, Period. Um, in 1970, stung by riots in more than 100 cities by angry and embittered African Americans, mm, HUD Secretary George Romney tried to pursue integration more vigorously than any other administration, either before or since. Observing that the federal government had imposed a suburban white noose around urban African-American neighborhoods, Romney devised a program he called Open Communities that would deny federal funds for water and sewer upgrades, green space, sidewalk improvements, and other projects for which HUD financial support is needed to suburbs that hadn't revised their exclusionary zoning laws to permit construction of subsidized apartments for lower-income African-American families. The anger about open communities among voters in the Republican Party's suburban base was so fierce that President Nixon reigned in Romney, required him to repudiate his plan, and eventually forced him from office. 
George Romney undertook his, his desegregation initiative only a few years after a series of civil rights measures had been enacted into law and after the assassinations of Martin Luther King Jr. and other civil rights leaders and activists. It followed upon the release of a widely discussed report on the causes of African-American writing published by an investigatory, com investigatory commission appointed by President Johnson and chaired by Illinois Governor Otto Kern. Because of all the attention to the suppression of African-Americans and to the federal government's partial responsibility for it, many Americans were receptive to Rodney's argument, although they were not sufficiently numerous or influential for him to prevail. Today, many fewer Americans are familiar with the extent of de jure segregation. The intellectual and political groundwork has not been laid for a revival of the George Romney program for or for the Obama's administration more modest 2015 rule. Americans are unaware of the de jure segregation history that makes the rule necessary. It is not difficult to conceive of ways to rectify the legacy of de jure segregation. In what follows, I'll suggest a few first of some that could not, that could not be enacted in today's political environment, and then some modest reforms that are still not politically possible would have are within closer reach. We might contemplate a remedy like this. Considering that African Americans comprise about 15% of the population of the New York metropolitan area, the federal government should purchase the next 15% of houses that come up for sale in Leopardtown at today's market rates, approximately $350,000. It should then resell the properties to qualified African Americans for $75,000, the price in today's dollars that their grandparents would have paid if permitted to do so. The government should enact this program in every suburban development whose construction complied with the FHA's discriminatory, uh, discriminatory requirements. If Congress established such a program and justified it based on the history of de jure segregation, courts should uphold that it is appropriate. Of course, no presently constituted Congress would adopt such a policy, and no present, presently constituted court would uphold it. Taxpayers will rebel at the cost, as well as the perceived undeserved gift to African Americans. I present this not as a practical proposal, but only to illustrate the kind of remedy that we would consider and debate if we had to dis disabuse ourselves of the de facto segregation myth. The second, and see that's yeah. my bad. Real no, quick. go ahead, baby. So go ahead. that's my thing. <laughs> like there was so much in here, but I'm gonna keep a mad short. But yo, it's he's saying like okay. What if you charge the descendants of people who were discriminated against, like the what their grandparents should have paid, and this will fix it? But of course, they won't even do that. And that's my whole thing when we learn about this stuff and we go about like different initiatives or like people centered things like reparations and how realistic you, you have to be and what that looks like. They won't even do. He's like, yo, they're not going to adopt no policy where they you still pay, even though it should be free. Like it, housing should be free. But he's like, we'll sell it to them at a reduced cost. But man, you know what? This. The Congress won't even approve that. So what do you think? They're going to give you millions of dollars each for 40 million? Yo, in order to get reparations, you're going to have to have a revolution. That's what it's going to take. Like, it don't matter what group you create, what you call yourself, how many feathers you stick in your 4C Afro, how many times you tell them you're not really black, black. Like, it's not going to fucking happen like that. You're the only way to get free from this fucked up system is to literally tear it down. And if you don't do it for you, at least do it for the people coming after you. But yeah, I just had to say that. That's Go ahead, baby, good. do your thing. Wake that shit up. Um, the, the segregation we should remedy is not only that of low-income families, but that of middle-class African-Americans who currently reside in towns like Lakeview, where Vince Meredith settled, and which is still today 85% African-American, or Roosevelt, Long Island, currently 79% African-American, another predominantly black middle-class town near where other Meredays found homes, or Prince George's County, 65% African-American outside of Washington, D.C., or Coleman Heights, 93% African-American outside of Chicago. Middle-class suburbs like these are attractive to many African-Americans, and no policy should force them to integrate against their will. But we should provide incentives for integration because these suburbs have disadvantages for their residents and for the rest of us. The most important disadvantage is that they frequently adjacent to low, they are frequently adjacent to low-income communities. About one-third of middle-class and upper-income Black of families now live in neighborhoods bordering severely disadvantaged areas, while only 6% of income similar white families do so. Black middle class adolescents living in such close proximity to ghettos must resist the lure of gangs and, whoa, this, I'm sorry, I did not expect this to go here, and of alienated behavior 
if they aspire to duplicate their parents' middle-class status. Even if they avoid such a trap, youth growing up in predominantly African-American communities, even middle-class ones, will gain no experience mastering a, a predominantly white professional culture in which they, as adults, will want to succeed. Federal subsidies subsidies for middle-class African-Americans to purchase homes in suburbs that have been racially exclusive are the most obvious incentive that could spur integration. Again, such assistance is both politically and judicial, judicially inconceivable today. Although government financial aid of this kind is still out of reach, advocates of integration can express their support in very local and even informal ways. If one, not the only one of the reasons that middle-class African-Americans hesitate to integrate is their expectation of hostility from subtly, 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 sorry, I don't know, I got this accent, hostile neighbors from for police who follow their son's homes, then community welcoming committees that, among other actions, insist that appropriate police training could be useful, making a point, perhaps even a requirement of advertising houses for sale in such neighborhoods with real estate agents who do business in segregated African-American communities could also help. Appreciate you. But yo, so y'all, y'all heard that, right? So that he would be, crazy. he'll name something that could help. Yo, the lure of gangs. Like, shut the whole fuck up, Cracker, who watched fucking, uh, what's that, that whatever gangster movie one time on BET and decided he knew what black culture was. I can't stand this kind of guy. But anyway, he would name solutions that he, in his mind, would help, but then follow it up in the next sentence, like, well, you know what? Not only would it not help, because we're just too far gone, but even if it did help, the state would not implement this or enforce it. So that's what kills me about people who try to think in terms of the state or within the constructs of like our current system and say, OK, well, I want to reform. This is why reform doesn't work, because you're never going to address the issue or the problem, because that's not what the state is for. That's not what the system is for. If you want people to eat, you can't have a system that incentivizes them not eating and for people to be like have hoard wealth and resources. If you want people to have housing, you can't have a system in place in which it's profitable to have the most expensive housing and have the least people to have access to that housing. Like you can't live in that system. So guess what? If you want housing for everybody, if you want people to have access to food, to be self-determining, to be liberated, you got to uproot and dismantle the system that makes it impossible for it to do so. And he names it over and over, yet it's still afraid to just name it what it is. He's still like, well, maybe, no, Cracker, not maybe. Liberation must happen. It's only going to happen through revolution. Also, good news. So this is the last chapter of the book. The rest is an epilogue and with other information, which I encourage y'all to, my baby mom has put the PDF in the Jumbotron, and y'all can go and look at it anytime. The reason why I'm excited that this is the last chapter because George Jackson is next. Also, too, Nietzsche has the audible of the color of uh, the color of money, which is a dope one, and it's read by a black woman. Which, you know, I'm being there listening. So, whenever she has that, but then the next one is going to be George Jackson. That one I encourage everyone to go to because whew, I can't wait to show my black ass out on that one. Shahid calls this ghetto audible, and I have to agree, and I think that's a compliment. <laughs> Another remedy would be a ban on zoning ordinances hey, that prohibit multifamily houses. I can keep going if you're busy. Uh, I can. Well, let me see how many we got. All right. Just, uh, yeah. Uh, if you keep going, I appreciate uh, it. Okay. You want me to? Yeah. Please. Thank you. Gotcha. Another remedy would be a ban on zoning ordinances that prohibit multifamily housing or that require all single family homes in a neighborhood to be built on large lots with high minimum requirements for square footage. These rules prevent both lower income and middle class families from settling in affluent suburbs. Exclusionary zoning ordinance were partly motivated by unconstitutional racial animosity. Banning them is not only good public policy, but constitutionally permissible, if not at the federal level, then by states. Alternatively, less extreme than an outright ban on exclusionary zoning, Congress could amend the tax code to deny the mortgage interest deduction on property owners in suburbs that do not have or are not taking aggressive steps to attract their fair share of low income or low to moderate income housing, both multi-unit and single family, whether for rental or, sa or, or sale. A fair share is one that is close to that of low and moderate income families in the suburbs metropolitan area, or as a constitutional remedy, the share of African Americans in a metropolitan area. How close is too close in a region with a substantial African American population, perhaps plus or minus 10%. 
The New York metropolitan area has an African popula- African American population of about 15% today. If we use a plus or minus 10% rule, then any suburb whose African American population was less than 5% should be considered segregated and required to take steps to integrate. For any community whose African American population was greater than 25%, special initiatives should be offered to help families move to integrated towns or to attract non-Black families to live there. Okay. See, here's my thing with that real quick, babe. I'm so uh, sorry to interrupt. But here's my thing. No, this, the problem isn't to, like, force people to move and live in only certain areas. The solution is to let people be self-determined. Like, if I purchase land, I want to live here, and I want to build my own house here, that should happen. Like, they have areas that they made for themselves. They built highways then to demolition Black neighborhoods. So, no, the, the solution isn't, like, we. if you have a white neighborhood, let's get five black people in there or whatever the fuck, right? That's not the – the solution is to unhand the resources, to stop exploiting the people so they can do for self. Like, allow people to have choices. Allow people to do – like, be autonomous. And that's what they refuse to do. His reforms is basically how can we keep the same system going, keep the same people exploited, but in a way where, you know, everyone gets along. And there's not too much writing. So that way they can just go to sleep and go to work and keep doing it in a continuous loop until they die at 75 and never collect their retirement. That's what his solution is. And that's not a solution. So don't, don't fall for that shit. Go ahead. Keep it going, mm-hmm. Sin. Complimenting a ban on exclusionary zoning is a requirement for inclusionary zoning. A positive effort to integrate low and moderate income families into middle class and affluent neighborhoods. Two states, New Jersey and Massachusetts, currently have fair share requirements based on income, not on race. They address the isolation of low-income families in urban areas and their absence from middle-class suburbs. They make a contribution to integration, but do not take the additional step of helping to integrate middle-income African-American families into white middle-class suburbs. Legislation in New Jersey requires suburbs that do not have a fair share of their metropolitan area's low-income housing to permit developers to build multi-unit projects that are frequently subsidized with either Section 8 or low-income housing tax credit funds. Similar legislation in Massachusetts requires developers in towns without a fair share of subsidized housing to set aside units in middle-income projects or for low-income families. Developments that do so are permitted more units per acre than would otherwise be allowed. Douglas Massey and his colleagues in Climbing Mount Laurel described one such, such successful project in a New Jersey suburb of Philadelphia. Disapproving fears of the area's middle-class residents, the project did not bring crime into the town of Mount Laurel, diminish the quality of its public schools, or otherwise harm the the community's character. If other states were to adopt legislation like that in New Jersey and Massachusetts, it would be a significant step towards the integration of all low-income families, not only African Americans. Real quick, Sin. So there's a question in the comments, which is dope. Y'all can leave as many questions as possible and we'll try to knock them out. So Mama Moto asks or says, I appreciate you clarifying the encoded talk and white saverism in the writing. And while I'm open to crackers writing, because I'm assuming that's a cracker, writing because I'm all for learning, I struggle with being open to them speaking on our circumstances. How do you reconcile that? So I don't. Like I say in almost all the recordings, crackers wrote this. The, and him, as you hear him in some of the passages, he literally apologizes over and over for it on behalf of his people. So I know where his like allegiance lies. So I'm not naive to it. But then also, too, I understand the circumstances that we're in. So when we describe segregation, right, and we describe the conditions in which black people live under, how they're purposely keep us, keep us so that we can't excel in school, so that we cannot be able to, like, write to our own circumstances. So then what ends up happening is the only people who have access to those institutions or can get in or who can stay awake long enough are the crackers. And then, then when they write about it, guess what? I read from everybody because I have to. But that includes the black ones. Now, the black authors, too, that are radical, because again, just being black don't mean you're radical. I don't take no affair as radical. That's that's a zero sum game for me. That's not hard. But for black folks, I do prioritize their vo- their voices and their writings. And like someone asked me to write ten books, or not write, but provide ten books that speak to this. Most of the ten, I think this is the only cracker in that list of ten. So, yeah, to answer your question, Mama Moto, you said, how do I reconcile with that? I don't. I know crackers aren't for our liberation. I know the white supremacist state is not for our liberation. But I also know that the facts that I laid out in this book that we highlighted 
that you can go back and fact check and that's what happened. So if a cracker says that this area is segregated, I'm not going to be like, no, it's not cracker because you said it. That doesn't make any sense. Right. So he's not speaking to my people's liberation. So that's not what we're reading this for. We're reading for this so we know exactly what happened so that people can stop falling for the myth that, oh, it's all in your mind or it's a conspiracy theory or pull yourself up by your bootstraps when you understand the facts of your condition. When it's written down there in plain text or when someone can translate it for you, then you can build a sustainable solution. So that's the that's the whole purpose of this. I hope that answered your question. But my bad. Go ahead, Sin. Um, some municipalities have inclusionary zoning ordinances that accomplish at a local level what the New Jersey and Massachusetts programs do statewide. The regulations usually require developers to set aside a share of units in new projects or low or moderate income families. As in Massachusetts, the developers are offered an incentive, higher density than is normally permitted, for example, to comply. The ordinances are sometimes effective, but unless they are implemented on a metropolitan-wide basis, their value as an integration tool is limited. If an, exclusion, an inclusionary zoning ordinance applies only to a single town, de developers can avoid its requirements and serve the same housing market by building instead in a neighboring town without such rules. Montgomery County, Maryland, has such a strong countywide inclusion zoning ordinance. Like much, like much such regulations, it requires developers and even the most affluent communities to set aside a percentage of units, in the case of Montgomery County, 12 to 15 percent, for moderate income families. It then goes further. The Public Housing Authority purchases a third of these set-aside units for rental to the lowest income families. The program's success is evidenced by the measurably higher achievement of the low-income African-American children who live and attend school in the country's wealthiest suburbs. Montgomery County's program should be widely duplicated. And see, that last line, like, like how Mama Moto was asking the comments, how do you read like text like this? that are written by crackers and this is how i do it you know i read with intent so when he talks about oh black kids did better when they were in white wealthy suburbs i don't read that and accept that as like oh we need to be next to crackers no i read that and say they got access to resources they had adequate housing they had good schools they had the supplies to be able to build their own success or whatever that whatever success looks like but to live right so that's how i read that so I just encourage people to read books in that way, too, because if we limit ourselves and we say, you know, I, don't, I won't read this, I won't look at that. Like I already said the word, it is limiting because this literally describes how this is done in cities. And so if you're someone who really wants the liberation of your people, right, you have a blueprint where you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You could just be like, all right, so these crackers did this in this zoning law in this city, in this town. Well, shit, I noticed the material conditions look the same around my way. Let me go look at the zoning laws and see how they help further racial and racial segregation. So that's just another point I wanted to bring up to try to like help answer that question in the comments. Again, thank you, Moto, because you're actually the first question in the comments, and I like that because it keeps challenging us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna go ahead and take up this one right quick. In 1993, a quarter century after the ha Fair Housing Act was enacted, John, we gonna call him John Booger because he's a crack. Wait, is he a crack? Yep, it's a cracker. We mispronouncing his name. <laughs> Reparations. John Booger, a University of North Carolina law professor, lamented and subsequent lack of progress toward residential integration. He suggested a fair share act that would require every state to establish mechanisms to ensure that each of its suburban or municipal jurisdictions houses a representative share of the African American as well as low and moderate income population in the metropolitan region. Profession, professor Booger, his name is B-O-G-E-R, I think it's Boger proposed that homeowners and jurisdictions that did not make progress towards such racial and economic integration would lose 10% of their mortgage interest in property tax deduction. The penalty would increase in each year of the jurisdiction's noncompliance with share goals until the entire deduction would be lost. If enacted, the plan would give citizens a powerful economic incentive to press their local officials to take reasonable steps towards integration. But the idea was not intended to be punitive, but it was. Professor Boger argued that Internal Revenue Service should keep funds equivalent to the loss deduction in an account at the Treasury, reserving these funds for helping segregated communities whose res residents had lost those deductions to develop public housing or lower moderate income subsidized housing. 
Because Professor Boger's purpose was not to challenge the de facto segregation myth, he did not add that such reserve funds could also be used to subsidize the middle class or even affluent African Americans to reside in suburbs that they could not otherwise easily afford. So basically, this guy, this professor, this old fay was like, you know, hey, let's put this stipulation in where if these areas won't desegregate, they pay like a penalty that would de directly impact like their mortgage, right? And that was a way, again, to profit off the system that they created, segregation, right? Now, that's my thing. <laughs> when we when we say I don't look to crackers for liberation, this is why. That's not a liberatory strategy. That's not restorative justice. Because as it goes on to say that this professor didn't even bother to like directly challenge segregation, he just saw a way to profit off them not desegregating. But he was not interested in challenging segregation. So it had nothing to do with the goodness of Black people. He basically used the plight of Black people and said, oh, yeah, y'all are mistreating these little Negroes. Well, I'm going to, I have a strategy that can make money off of punishing people who mistreat these Negroes, but I'm not going to make these Black folks' conditions any better whatsoever because I don't care. I just see a way to make a profit. That's basically what we just read. Just wanted to break that shit down real quick. Um, let's see. Uh, but in view of the de jure origins of suburban segregation, this too would be an appropriate use of the withheld taxpayer deduction. I'm sorry, inappropriate. Professor proposal for a fair share act is no less timely today than when he first advanced it. Uh, I'm going to knock this one out right quick, Sin. Successful civil rights lawsuits have led to few innovative programs that integrated low-income families into middle-class neighborhoods. In 1995, the American Civil Liberties Union of Maryland sued HUD and the Baltimore Housing Authority because as these agencies demolished public housing projects, they resettled tenants, frequently with Section 8 vouchers, almost exclusively in segregated low-income areas. The lawsuit resulted in com commitments by the federal and local governments to support the former residents in moving to high opportunity suburbs. The authority now funds an increase of subsidy higher than the regular Section 8 voucher amount to families that rent in non-segregated communities throughout Baltimore County and other nearby counties. Participants can use their vouchers in neighborhoods where the poverty rate is less than 10 percent. The population is no more than 30 percent African-American or other minority and fewer than 5 percent of households are subsidized. The mobility program not only places voucher holders in apartments, it also purchases houses on the open market and then rents them to program participants. <laughs> it provides intensive counseling to the former public housing residents to help them adjust to their new predominantly white and middle class environments. Counseling covers topics such as household budgeting, cleaning and maintenance of appliances, communicating with landlords and making friends with neighbors. Those who have participated in this Baltimore program left communities with average poverty rates of 33 percent and found in new dwellings where average rates were 8%. In their former neighborhoods, the African-American population was 80%. In their new ones, it is 21%. However, only a small portion of former public housing tenants can participate in the program. Most use their Section 8 vouchers as the recipients nationwide to subsidize living in already segregated low-income areas. So basically what it says is that it didn't help Black people as a whole. It helped very few exceptions who then got to move up to the middle class. But for the majority of Black people who, who got um, a part of this program, they literally stayed in the same places or worse. That's important because a lot of times they use the exceptions as like the standard. Like, oh, this person made it. Obama became president. You can too. No, First of all, why would you want to be ahead of imperialist? Y'all going to have me start on a white settler colonial state and start doing my communist propaganda. Let me keep reading. <laughs> a similar program arose, but it is important to not use the exception to the rules as like, oh, therefore it's not as bad. That's not true. Especially when all you have to do is go outside and look at your material conditions. We are not okay. A similar program arose from a lawsuit filed in 1985 by a civil rights group against the Dallas Housing Authority and HUD over their use of the public housing or section eight programs to perpetuate segregation. Here too, the case settlement provided families with a higher value voucher when they relocated to a non-segregated suburb where the poverty rate is low and where public school, stu public school students are high performing. A Dallas civil rights group, the Inclusive Community Project, uses settlement funds for security deposits and counseling services to help families make the adjustment from racially segregated public housing in Section 8 neighborhoods to integrated suburban environments, as in Baltimore. The Dallas program desegregates only a small percentage of families who are eligible for housing assistance. A few other cities also now 
have modest programs, some also resulting from settlements and lawsuits that challenge how the Section 8 program reinforces segregation. That assist voucher holds on in moving to lower poverty areas. Several municipalities and states outlaw flat refusals by landlords to lease to Section 8 voucher families, and those jurisdictions seem to be making a bit more progress toward integration. To allow owners to claim that they are not discriminating by race when renters are turned away slowly because they subsidize they are subsidized to make a mockery of the Fair Housing Act. Such discrimination should be prohibited everywhere, but it's not. And I have an example of that. So, y'all, and uh, when I was working in an oil field in Louisiana, so these crackers, right, would talk about how they own houses because they got access to higher paying jobs. So they got to buy up a lot more houses and they would be landlords and rent to people who, you know, didn't have access to those kind of jobs. So basically what it looks like, you have the oil field jobs that pay over 100K and then you have like, McDonald's and Walmart that pay maybe seven fifty five or eight dollars an hour, right? That and most of the people in that area are working in those type of jobs. And the people in the refinery don't even live in that area. They usually come from forty five minutes to an hour away. So the thing, reason why I say that is what they would do is that they would buy a houses in the area, right? And would brag brag about how they would because they couldn't racially discriminate in their ads when they would say, "Hey, house for rent." So what they would do is they would put the house for more way more than the local people can afford. And the people who answered, of course, were usually crackers. And they'd be like, oh, that's who I... And then they'll tell them, like, oh, it's not really this much a month. It's actually, like, 700, 800. I just do this so I don't get Black people to answer the ads. That's another way in which they did shit like this to, like, deny, like, being able to take vouchers and stuff. And, man, I'm talking... This is everyday shit. Like, if people listen to what people are saying at work, if people listen to, like, just go outside and go talk to people, man. You'd be surprised. Motherfuckers literally debitize themselves to like perpetuate white supremacy in everyday acts. The Section 8 voucher program is not an entitlement. Many more eligible families don't receive vouchers that de- vouchers than do because Section 8 budgetary op- appropriations are too small. In 2015, approximately 1 million families had vouchers, but another 6 million who qualified went without them. There are long waiting lists for vouchers and in every city that has a large African-American low-income population. And then also, too, these vouchers weren't just for Black people. So I don't like how he keeps saying that. Literally, the book I'm going to include in the next reading is um, When Affirmative Action Was White. And it's not just talking about when they were given, like, free houses away, basically, and all that. It's also talking about who got reci- who were, like, a lot of people who got Section 8. A large number of them were crackers. So that, too. Indeed, in many cities, the waiting lists have been closed. So in addition to prohibiting discrimination against voucher holders, Congress should appropriate funds to provide vouchers for all whose low income status qualifies. The housing subsidy that the federal government gives to middle class, mostly white homeowners, is an entitlement. Any homeowner with enough income to file a detailed tax return can claim a deduction both for property taxes and mortgage interest. The government does not tell homeowners that that only the first few who file can claim the deductions and the rest are out of luck because the money has been used up. But that is how we handle Section 8 subsidy for lower income, mostly African-American renters. So long as the shortage of vouchers persists, Congress should require that local housing authorities establish a reference for tenants who volunteer to use their Section 8 benefits to find apartments in integrated, low poverty neighborhoods. To make this possible, other reforms are necessary. Voucher amounts are normally set to permit leasing of apartments whose rents are close to the median for the metropolitan area. But rental amounts that are typical for a metropolitan area overall are too low for leasing in most low poverty neighborhoods. So voucher amounts will have to be increased if programs like Baltimore's are to expand nationwide and more dollars for security deposits, for example, made available as well. Large numbers of counselors and social workers will have to be hired and trained. Funds will also have to be authorized to enable authorities to purchase single family homes for some former public housing residents. In Baltimore, the court order compelled HUD to come up with such funds. Expanding this program will require Congressional Act. In its waning days, the Obama administration announced that HUD would begin calculating Section 8 voucher amounts for smaller areas than a full metropolis, metropolitan area. Section 8 recipients would receive larger subsidies to rent apartments in higher cost middle class neighborhoods and smaller subsidies to, low, to use in low neighborhoods where rent are lower. As this is written, it is it is too soon to know whether the administration will maintain or reverse this policy. Other more technical reforms of the Section 8, and I already told you an example of how like people in the local area like battled this. So basically what it says is that 
when they would get vouchers, they can only, even with vouchers, they still can only afford to be in rundown neighborhoods. So Obama passed a policy that in which these vouchers would cover more so that they can get to houses that might cost more, but are, of course, the more they cost, usually the, the better they are, especially in comparison. So the way average people, average crackers would, you know, subvert this is again, they would up it, the price even more to rent. And then when they saw it was a white family, they would lower it back down and then take the voucher. But if it was a black family, they'd be like, nah, it, it costs 300, 3000 a month to stay here. And they'd be like, yo, my voucher won't cover that. And I can't cover the rest. So they wouldn't live there. And that's practice still today. And, and that city is named St. James, Louisiana. And I need y'all to do research on St. James, Louisiana, because it also has one of the highest records in the country for women that were given unnecessary hysterectomies. Oh, I'm not, man. This is what happens when you be outside. You be finding out how evil these fucking old faces are. And now, then y'all wonder why I be saying crack a 50 million times. To keep my teeth white, that's why. Other more technical reforms, a Section 8 program could also help. For example, the vouchers are usually administered by a city housing authority that has no right to permit the vouchers to be used outside city limits. Vouchers can't contribute much to integration unless such jurisdiction rules are eliminated and the program is organized as a metropolitan basis. Safe policy could also improve the potential of Section 8 to promote integration. Illinois, uh, yeah, Illinois presently extends a property tax reduction to landlords and low poverty neighbors who, who rent to voucher holders. Other states could do otherwise. The federal department, and again, that doesn't eliminate racial bias by the person who's doing, who's renting out, the landlord who's renting out. The federal department of the treasury should require states to distribute the low-income housing tax credits to developers building in integrated high-opportunity neighborhoods and segregated areas. A project that purports to help revitalize the community should be approved only as part of the coordinated urban development program. That includes transportation, infrastructure, job creation, exclusionary zoning, and su supermarkets, community policing, and other characteristics of healthy neighborhoods. But when developers have claimed to use tax credits to upgrade urban neighborhoods, what they have most frequently meant is bringing modern housing to the impoverished community. Now construction is fine, but it can also reinforce segregation. 50 years of experience has shown that mobilizing the funds to support revitalization low-income communities is a politically difficult as integrating suburbs. So we continue to have more tax credit projects and more Section 8 housing and segregated neighborhoods without surrounding the community import improvements that were promised. Revital revitalization does generally occur when a neighborhood becomes attractive to the middle class. While too often the gentrification that follows does not include strict enforcement of exclusionary zoning principles, and it gradually drives the African-American poor out of their now upgraded neighborhood and into newly segregated inner ring suburbs. I hate this place. <laughs> this is the last section, too, if you want to read us in, or if you don't, it's all good. I got you. Um, Appreciate it. Frank and Rosalie Stevenson raised three daughters in their segregated Richmond neighborhood, where average student performance was among the lowest in the state of California. When the girls were in the primary grades in the 1950s and early 1960s, African-American children composed only 22% of Richmond's elementary school population, but six of the district's elementary schools were over 95% African-American. Schools in Richmond were segregated primarily because federal and local housing policies had segregated the city itself. But Richmond schools officials took additional measures to ensure that African-American children did not attend the same school as white children. For example, the Peary School, with a 93% Black enrollment in 1967, was situated west of the railroad tracks in a neighborhood that included three blocks that had remained white. The school board carved the three-block strip out of the Peary's attendance zone and assigned students who lived there to attend the all-white building school across the railroad tracks. The school in, that the Stevenson's daughters attended, Verde Elementary in an unincorporated North Richmond, was west of the railroad tracks and not far from the oil refinery. The school had originally been constructed in 1951 to prevent black students from attending nearby white schools in, uh, schools in white neighborhoods. Verde was still 99% African American in 1968 when it became so overcrowded that the school district had to respond. Meanwhile, nearby schools in white neighborhoods had many empty seats as a growing number of white families left R Richmond for the suburbs. But instead of allowing African-American children to occupy those seats, the district decided to build an addition to Verde. This was such an obvious attempt to perpetuate segregation that the civil rights group sued. 
The trial judge or ordered integration and later told an interviewer that he had been offended by the racially biased. See, I hear the segregated sounds of the Bronx in the background. My bad. He had been offended by the racially biased testimony of a school board member who had defended the district's policy. Instead of appealing the judge's decision, the district to agreed to a desegregation plan that modified attendance zones. But before the policy could be implemented, voters elected an anti-integration majority to the school board and then reneged on its commitment. Instead, it adopted a voluntary, voluntary program in which African-American ch children could choose to attend a predominantly white school. By 1980, only one in six black children had done so. These were generally children with the most educationally sophisticated and motivated parents. Their transfers left schools in Richmond's black neighborhoods with the most disadvantaged students, those with the lowest academic performance and the greatest behavioral challenges. Even today, as low-income Hispanic families replace African Americans in North Richmond, all students at the Verde School receive subsidized, lunch, subsidized lunches and 58% of its parents have not completed high school. Richmond's school board could easily segregate its elementary schools because Richmond's neighborhoods were segregated. But for junior and senior high schools, the district created artificial boundaries that prevented many African-American students from enrolling in their local schools. Instead, the district transported them to predominantly African-American schools that were already more congested than the white ones. Whites ha also had to travel longer distances to avoid attending heavily African-American schools near their, home, near their homes. The assistant superintendent explained at a 1958 public meeting called to protest that segregation, the boundaries assigned to mostly, eh, sorry, child, it's mad loud in the Bronx right now, assigned to mostly black Richmond Union High School, the bulk of students who can benefit from the shop program here, they, there and the existing boundaries of mostly white Harry Ellis High School are valid because the students who are grouped there are those who can profit from the academic program. That was a quote. Civil rights protests forced the school district to redraw the high school attendance boundaries in 1959, but because of neighborhood segregation, African Americans remain concentrated in the two two of the 11 junior high schools in Rich and in the Richmond High School. That's where Terry, the youngest of the Stevenson girls, graduated in 1970. Off and on, she took community college courses but never completed a college degree. She worked all her life in daycare centers and as a nursing assistant and has six children of her own. Terry Stevens's two sons are warehouse workers. Of her four daughters, two are certified nurse assistants, one answers phone inquiries at a bank, and one is a security guard. Terry Stevenson's sisters also have children. They include a paralegal working at a law firm, a pharmacist assistant, a clerical worker at a government school, a government social service agency, and a department store sales clerk. White, what might have become of these Stevenson grandchildren if their parents had grown up and attended school in an integrated Melapitas and not in DeJour seg segregated Richmond? Should, now, should they now have partners with similar occupations, their household incomes are unlikely to arrive above, above the fourth income quintile of Americans. How much further on the social economic ladder would they have been able to climb if they had grown up in a well-educated household as a result of Terry and her sisters being permitted to attend a high school that was designed for students who can, quote unquote, who can per, per profit from the academic program rather than the ones who instead offered manual training? How different might the lives of the Stevenson grandchildren have been were it not for the federal government's unconstitutional determination to segregate their grandparents and their parents as well? What do we, the American community, owe this family in this and future generations for their loss of opportunity? How might we fulfill this obligation? So that was the last chapter. We made it, y'all, after about 150 million crackers later. <laughs> Yo, so yeah, that was really um, good. That, and there's so much to say. Like that was really, really good. If y'all want to have a discussion, how about it? I do have to like get on this road and get to Plano like within the next hour. So I'm gonna be on mute, but I'll give anyone who wants a co-host or a mic, and y'all can talk it out, or I can close the space. It's totally up to y'all. But um, yeah, the next book is gonna be Blood in My Eye. Oh. <sighs> If y'all want to see me in my full black ass communist gay ass mode, that book does it to me every time, every time. So yeah, it is and so like relevant. So yeah, I'm gonna go on mute and 
let me get someone some co-hosts up in here because that way Mama Moto's requested a mic. I think I gave it to you. And then I don't see if you have one. Do you have a mic, Mama Moto? I don't know why my screen's not showing it. Yeah, can you guys hear me? There we go. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't know how long it's going to last because uh, Twitter's been hella fucking glitchy lately. Um, so if I disappear. <laughs> yeah, so I got to this one late and I don't really know how your book rooms work. Like, do you have certain days you do this or like, do you guys just do it on the rando? Like when you get time, you just open it and then keep working through the book or like, what is the format of what you guys are doing? All right, so that is... A perfect question. So I'm going to leave it up to like the community and the people because I'm going to be honest, I'll be ripping and running. Like right now, I'm literally pulled over the highway. Like, because I was like, yo, let me knock this shit out because I'm not going to be able to get to it. But if y'all like request a certain day that works and we get enough people to say, hey, you know, every Saturday at this time works for, for the majority of people and they're recorded, then I'll do it that way. But I'm open to suggestions. So I don't have a set schedule to answer your question, but I am open to if that works more for people to have a set time so they can make plans around it, then I'm open to that. Just let me know. No, I think yeah, it's random. The rando because like um, rando is good for me because I never know, especially like with meetings, you know, I kind of know how the meetings are set at work, but, you know, I'd be sneaking on here while I'm at work. Um, and I'm, I'm blessed to have a job that I can like listen and interact and bullshit on Twitter, you know? <laughs> um, no, but no, I like it. I was just asking because, you know, the, when you mention blood in my eye, you know, George Jackson, I'm excited. So I'm, I'm not trying to miss none of that. And I have, I have solid dad brother, but I don't have blood in my eye and all the revolutionaries and, you know, the scholars I'd be around, everybody is always reading blood in my eye over and over and over again. And so now it's like a chance for me to get in on it, a fresh start. I'm going to go get it. You know what I'm saying? So I can read along with y'all. So like, I'm very excited about that because I definitely do know who George Jackson is and would like to see why, you know, the revolutionaries love that book so much. So yeah. Same, yo. It's, that one too is definitely going to be like open to discussion because I'm telling y'all when y'all hear the book especially when y'all know I, I be saying like oh I'm just going to skip I'm not going to talk too much I can't fucking help it <laughs> I be getting too part time and be like y'all no let's talk about this so I think it's going to be a dope ass discussion um, I'll make sure to try to send reminders ahead of time so that way people won't miss it and can actually take part in it and then too like you you did today don't hesitate to like leave questions down there so we can answer them. I am going to work on giving out mics more. I am. And then also too, if y'all have any book recommendations. So the reason why we did color law was because of Ms. Crit. Ms. Crit was like, yo, this book needs to be read. And she was absolutely right. So, and then Anitra did, uh, suggested the color of money and a bunch of other books. She has like a whole list. And, um, so yeah, if y'all have recommendations, let me know and we can knock those out too. But yeah, I want, definitely concentrate on black revolutionary books. And then like Mama Moto brought up in the question about black authors. I know a lot of people do not know a lot of black authors, so it is important to highlight them. So I'm definitely going to uh, find more books that aren't mainstream that actually talk to our conditions in much radical terms. If y'all hear what black revolutionaries thought or black radical thinkers actually thought, it gonna make a lot of people uncomfortable because they're talking about upending everything and why and how and what that looks like. And it's not clean and cut. It's talking about, man, your your brother and your sister in your household, you might have to take them out because they might align with fascism. Like, they talk about that hard-hitting shit. So, yeah, I'm going to try to introduce some of those underground books that don't really get a lot of praise and a lot of highlight. But Let me send you a book. I got one that was written by a woman that was in the Black Panthers, and we never hear from them. So um, you're going to love that one. Ooh, and, um, yeah, she went to prison for a lot of years and talks about... Um, you know, I mean, it gave me so much guilt about the political prisoners. So when you said you got a prison call, like I felt it like, oh, OK, I see what you want. But, yeah, oh, I always told you I respect you as a revolutionary. So, yeah. Oh, no, it's yo. Uh, yeah. Oh, I'm glad you said about the prison call. So, yeah, I'm going to make a thread in which how people can support people locked up. So George Jackson, too, because, you know, Black August but also, too, like about our black brothers and sisters locked up currently right now. You know, I was talking with uh, Flea, who some of y'all remember, and that's a brother I talk to often still. And he talks about how on the women's side of his prison, 
he don't never see visitors like rarely it might be their moms and their grandmas but it is rarely like their partners and a lot of them are put in there because they are trying to be the ride or die unfortunately and then of course state repression but yeah a lot of our sisters get lost and forgotten behind bars and a lot of our revolutionary sisters get lost like i can't tell you how many protesters that got arrested black women that are sitting by and forgotten I'm going to make a threat of them so that way y'all can be able to support them as well as all our political prisoners. They need to be released. The Pendleton, too, in Louisiana, that is a story that I'm going to read to y'all, too, and how that they literally could have been out of jail. But they sided with their people to say, you, you know what? The prison state is too much. We're fighting with you. And now they're currently locked up for life. And over over charges, I believe one was in for seven years. And I think the other one was only had like two more left to go. But he's, he heard the call to action. and He made a decision. He said, man, it was either fight. Or just get out and just go to work, go to sleep and die. And he chose revolution in his mind. He chose revolution. I agree with him. That's a resistance fighter to me. So he is a political prisoner. They are, both of them. So yeah, thank you for bringing that up too. I'm going to go on mute so I can get to driving. But I don't know if someone needs a co-host or whatever. If y'all want to keep talking. Or we can end the space. She still has a mic. And I got to the book really late. Like, uh... What's your overall synopsis of it? Because I I was in a couple spaces and I did hear him speaking to how uh, the laws were actually affecting Black people. So that was like good to hear. I did like that because uh, we don't actually talk about that enough and they love pushing generational wealth through uh, land and home ownership and kind of do a, like a blaming thing on black people like, oh, why don't you own land? Why don't you have property? Why, you know, you, you know, black people, and there, I'm not gonna lie, there were mistakes made in past generations um, with keeping property, but then um, some black people were uh, put in circumstances where they weren't able to hold on to properties. And then there's uh, gentrification. So like, what did you take from the book to right. You have a mic. I can't ask anybody. <laughs> yeah. I'm also Penny. If you want to give me co-host, I can let other people up while you're driving. Ooh, let's do that. Um, uh, real quick before before I go though, I I just want to answer Mama Mona's question right quick. Yo, so what I got from what I get from this book is just facts. Oh my bad, y'all. I don't know if I cut out. That was another prison call. Um, it's just facts. Like here's the cities, the towns that happened in, the name of the mayor. The name of the politicians, the name of the the people who headed different organizations, like it just literally lists like names, dates, times, and what the organizations were named, and they're still in effect today. So that's what I take from this book. I tell people to go back and look at that, highlight the name. Yo, the insurance companies that they named in the book still exist today. The banks that they named in the book that helped solidify uh, segregation still exist today. The housing organizations still exist today all that stuff is relevant so i take the facts from it and then as far as like mistakes done on behalf of our people to err is human so no error should lead to you being cut out of housing no 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 error should lead to you not having access to a good quality of life so the onus is always on the oppressor it's always on the state because that's literally what put what was put in place to make sure that that outcome was always you and your people having nothing and being exploited and being traumatized and oppressed so that's that's what i get from the book yeah um i got similar things i think another important point for me was really dispelling the myth that like oh this was something that happened in the south because there are a lot of examples in the book about how that happened in the urban north as well um, and again, like really seeing how on every level they are conspiring against us. So it's the federal government, state government, it's the city, it's the town, and also the niggas who live right next door to you. Like there's no place or way that we were safe under these conditions. Um, and it's not just like, oh, this legislation is going to fix it. Because how does the legislation fix the fact that your neighbors are going to go to meetings every Saturday and figure out how to get your black ass out of the neighborhood? Ain't no law to fix that. Like, this is something that they're conspiring to do on every level. Wow, thank you. <laughs> like, it made me, like, your, your guys' feedback made me go download the book. So, yeah, thank you yeah. for that. I also put the um, all the recordings in the jumbo, and I think that's good just to have for record keeping, too. Um, I think I really like your earlier question, too, because I do struggle with that same thing. 
for me, what I what I do when I read white people's authors is I think about me being a spy on like enemy territory. So I'm reading this book where white in this book he also admits how he got his own motherfucking privilege. White people are not smart. They didn't become this power because they were more intelligent. They got this power because they were fucking dirty and willing to do shit that we were not willing to do in terms of violence and genocide. And so they're not smart. They tell on themselves all the time. So you read a book like this and he'll tell you how his own whiteness led to the fact that we're reading his book right now and not realize that he's implicating himself in all of this, even through like what his justifications and saying, oh, they did it for their own well-being. And I do that with a lot of other white authors, too. I think it would like you sound crazy when you say, you know, it in this book, he doesn't say it because he doesn't have the range. But um, I've read another book by someone who's actually a Nazi who literally said, yo, if you put all the black people close together like this, it's easier to take them out all at one time. And if you go into a room and you say, hey, they put us in ghettos and the word ghetto is very intentionally put on us because it is systemic death, right? It's a a systemic way to eliminate us. So this book won't go that far. It won't say that they're systemically eliminating us through a ghetto. But if you read a Nazi, the nigga will say it outright. But we don't read Nazis because we don't agree with them. And I agree with that. Like, I'm not saying go out. Like, there's a balance here that I hope y'all are getting. That I'm not saying it's, these niggas are smart, but I'm saying they tell on themselves. And if we read what they tell about themselves, they, we can really read how they're really planning to kill us. They're plan- they're doing all these things intentionally. It's not just like the luck of the draw, if that makes sense. No, it makes perfect sense. Like, I love that because that's what I was thinking is that even though I had some initial discomfort, I said to myself, like, you know, if you know anything, especially... Uh, people that are interested in revolutionary thought and black scholarship is like, if you really are in a war and we know that these people are against us, you cannot opt out of this shit. Like they, they set up the whole society to be against us. So if you're in a war, you have to understand your enemy. That's what Sun Tzu said when he wrote the art of war. So you cannot, you know, you don't have the option to opt out. Like, even though it's uncomfortable, even though it makes you feel a little funny because you're like a cracker said this, but you still got to, like, hear what they say. Because, like you said, they tell them themselves. So, like, yeah, that made me, like, more comfortable. And I'm glad I asked her how she reconciled it. Because, I like, at first I was like, is this a cracker? (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, one girl, we got (laughs) Yo, no, I love that. And I think, too, that's why I'm excited for, to read George Jackson, because we could read the Crackers and, like, be in their war room. But when we read George Jackson, we in our own war room, and we see in our own strategy, and we're talking through and building amongst, each like, each other, which is super valuable. Um, there's someone new on the stage. Hey, Victor. Can y'all hear this person? Are they talking? No, it looks like he's still on mute. Hey, what's up, host? What's up, choose? How y'all? It's Vaughn, choose. I heard you. What's going on? How y'all? Good, we reading. All right, bet. Oh, were you here for the reading, or you just say hi? Um, I'm gonna listen. I'm gonna listen. I'm probably gonna go back down on the listeners. Period. Um, I guess as we're talking about um the book for folks who've been here for like other readings and stuff, I think um Mama Moto's question was um strong because it's like what do we just take away from this? Um, I think like I said, one of my biggest takeaways is that like yeah, this wasn't a southern thing. When they try to, like, you know, gaslight us and say, oh, this is something that, you know, in the South they had segregation and in the North it was different. Um, that's something I take from it. So I guess I'll leave that to the room if anyone wants to pick that up. Also know that I'm getting DMs that people are at work listening, which is why I love these rooms, too, because you can just be in the middle of the day doing other stuff and just be listening to folks build and listening to folks read. So that's also good. I know folks are... Unfortunately, under these capitalistic conditions. So, yeah. So, what I can do is I can go ahead and end the space. I'm, like, glad people had discussions. Oh, there was uh, comments at the bottom. I think Joe had left a few. Um, Y'all hear me drive. (laughs) But one of them was, like, that he knew a few people who benefited from one of the programs mentioned in the book. 
And then there's other comments too. So I encourage y'all to like read that. And again, uh, my baby mom's put the PDF and the Jumbotron. And I think the thread of the other spaces that y'all can check out anytime. George Jackson, y'all just let me know when time is good for y'all and we'll work it out. And I'll try to do it in advance. Like today is Tuesday. Friday's good for me to knock out some of George Jackson. And I think Saturday might be better. And so it's up to y'all. If that sounds good to y'all, let me know. Another day or another suggestion, I'm open to it too. So I'm going to go ahead and hit the space. I appreciate y'all coming. Unless we appreciate you, you having this space for us, Penn, because we really appreciate you. Like, and I know you hear this a lot, but like when you be reading and you be like, no, let me not go too far. Like, no, we want you to go far. We want you to say what the fuck you got to say. We love hearing you speak and loving hearing like how you're processing the text because it helps us process it too. So thank you for holding these spaces. I mean, caring about our, you know, political education and our well-being. So we appreciate you. I appreciate that. And remember y'all check on each other. Real talk. And keep looking out for each other. That's important. All right. Well, I'll hit y'all up later. I'll probably let y'all know on the timeline when the next space is, the George Jackson one, and we'll take it from there. I appreciate y'all. And of course, stay black.